you know, the splitting of the nucleus of the atom, and we were able to do it with that large, unstable nucleus of the uranium atom, I believe is one of the most fateful moments in the whole history of humanity. That it should happen when it did, when we as a species are so immature in some ways in terms of understanding the consequences of our action and being able to uh, seize and ripen with the wisdom of some of our great teachers. Uh, I think it changed everything because uh, actually it released the strongest binding power in the universe. That's the binding nuclear power which holds the neutrons and protons together. And that is the basis of a phenomenal reality. And here in, in New Mexico, in the Manhattan Project, uh, this changed everything for humans on this earth and for all beings, I think, because it changed our relationship to time. It changed uh, the uh, kind of karma or consequences of our actions. This means that because of the longevity of the radioactive isotopes released, uh, that means that we can, with one decision taken in haste, have a reach into geological time spans for uh, not only hundreds of thousands of years, but millions of years. And now, with the use of the waste in depleted uranium, which we're using in warfare now, it reaches into billions of years. That these uh, contaminants, the capacity to cripple and kill, to enter into the uh, mutagenic makeup of all beings is out and out of control. So uh, we could just <laughs> tear our hair and gnash our teeth, but there's, that's not enough because what that means for us is a challenge to realize uh, something about our capacity, the capacity of mind, the capacity of consciousness that we are endowed with, the capacity for us to choose a course of action the capacity to discipline ourselves, the capacity to wake up to uh, the miracle of life and our capacity to shepherd and protect life. So uh, it also had a incredible and quite dangerous, if not disastrous, effect on our democracy because of the secrecy that attended the creation of the poison fire. We bury it in the earth as if geological disposal, as if the earth were some safe deposit vault, as if it didn't move and change and have waters running through it. We think we can, oh, we'll transmute it, but that's enormously expensive and no way to deal with the literal mountains of uh, contamination. Please let us look at what we are doing to each other and to the future generations. And this, it's not just nuclear waste that we think of as some byproduct. It is everything. Every container, every booty, every truck, every instrument involved in the nuclear fuel cycle, you know. So... That's the uh, poison fire, and what, can it become a teacher? It must. What would it teach us? What can it teach What do we need to learn? We can learn to be faithful. We can learn to be fearless at looking what, at what we have 
created and generated. We can learn to uh, extend the power of our human solidarity, not only with those living now, but with the children's children's children, not only with the seventh generation, but with all the generations to come. Well, in doing that, something, a great blessing can occur, don't you think? It's not just like some curse that, oh, what we've done, we have to remind to make it better somehow to protect the future ones, but no, it can be a kind of uh, means of living into the promise of the consciousness with which we have been endowed. That's the miracle of life, our participation in life. So, you know, that was on my mind when I was burying a treasure vase. I live in Berkeley, California, and uh, we have on campus, right around the corner from me, uh, up on the hills there, the uh, Berkeley uh, Lawrence Laboratory. And that has played a key role in the uh, fabrication of plutonium. And uh, we learned, and the citizens learned, and it, quite, it became quite an issue, uh, that there was, they were doing experimenting with radioactive isotope of hydrogen, uh, which is a product of the whole um, operation. And um, this was right above the University of California and a densely inhabited city with schools. And at the Lawrence uh, Hall of Science right there, school children come by buses several times a week. So there was quite a bit of agitation and concern, you better believe it, that here was this laboratory uh, working with tritium. And I uh, thought, well, that would be a good place for a treasure vase. So uh, in the evening, because there's quite a strong sense of security there, uh, I... Uh, Fran Macy, my husband, Christopher Macy, my firstborn son, Paloma Pavel, a colleague. Uh, I think she was involved in another treasure vase, too. And Christopher Reed, Buddhist teacher. Uh, we had been uh, filling the vase and inviting people to contribute to it. Uh, it was at my home for some uh, weeks and then we closed it and we went up and I remember we waited until the Lawrence Hall of Science was closed and locked for the night and then we it's on quite a steep hill so we snuck around <laughs> the base mid right below the lab and worked our way over to a place that looked like uh, it would be close enough to the tritium lab to have its uh, benign influence. And we uh, knelt down there and with trowels uh, put it in. And uh, we said some prayers and uh, then made our way out. So there it is. There it is. As I drive past there, uh, at least uh, once a week or more with my grandchildren. And uh, I think of it and I think, what, what's it doing? And I, I'm not tempted to try to proclaim what emanations or what. It's doing something right now in each of us who is involved in it, as are the other vases. And if I have, as I do, 
Tibetan brothers and sisters who have said, get them out there. They, in and of themselves, will have a transformative power. It's okay. I'll do it. I don't have any, I don't feel the need to ascribe to that. But I want to be part, just aesthetically, just morally, uh, of anything that lets us enact our intention for a nuclear-free world. I honor the uh, work of Cynthia and her colleagues and the Earth Treasure Vase as one of many uh, deeply spiritually informed and deeply imagined responses. This is a beautiful object, that it's a vessel, that it's physical, that it's concrete, that it's part of a long uh, tradition, noble tradition. That's good. A lot of our work as we measure up to the dimensions of the dangers that we have created for Earth and the challenges we've created for ourselves and what the promise can be that uh, we can say that we're planting treasure vases in our psyches, that each time we take seriously uh, the teachings, be they from the Buddha Dharma, or from the Haudenosaunee, or the Navajo. We're doing it for the future generations. And then that is calling forth from them, so convinced are they of the power of our being able to do something for the future ones through history, that that in itself, if we can integrate that, is a great blessing for us. It kind of lifts us up onto a stage of history, like a great <laughs> morality play or something. It calls us to see that there is something that we can do. So much of our lives seem to be just concerned with the nitty gritty of daily life and the list of things to do. And we can, uh, through disciplines of our mind and what we choose to do with our energy and actions that we can play a role that can extend through time like a blessing. It's like I'm planting a treasure vase in my psyche. I can see that we ourselves are like vessels that we can keep offering and that we can um, take care of what we put in it, the teachings, the prayers, the glimpses of beauty, the celebrations, uh, to make good vessels of ourselves. That revolutionizes how we see ourselves. The industrial growth society sees us as consumers, consumers that are needy, insufficient, driven by dissatisfactions and cravings, which are whipped up by the advertising, by the whole culture. To see ourselves as vessels of the holy, wow, that would be a revolutionary act. That would be a liberating, a liberation from so much that is demeaning and tawdry and really corrosive to the spirit of the, our contemporary economic culture. So to see ourselves as vessels of what we want to uh, bring to life, which is healing. You could say that's like a miracle if we could do that, but of course, that's perfectly within our power, totally. 
It's not just some wishful thing, because actually our way here from the beginning of time is just littered with miracles. The fact that uh, the living cell could uh, find itself uh, awake on this planet, that life, the great forces of life, the uh, living oceans, the whole story, are learning to breathe, my God, to overcome diseases, to overcome slavery, to build the stupas and the cathedrals, to create the symphonies, to create the telescopes through which you can look out into the nebulae and see them looking back. What a journey it's been. So, of course, this miracle, a miracle is, it's due, we're due for a miracle now. I mean, it has to happen, not we're due for it, but without it, uh, this could be the closing chapter. And it would be an ignominy and a nuclear winter and disease and, and uh, deformities and, and uh, choosing not to go that way choosing to find our courage and community and solidarity, that's a miracle. But it's no greater miracle than the fact that you and I are sitting here and that we actually have a caring for this. <laughs> you know, there are um, countless people, millions, millions even of organizations that are grassroots based, nonprofits, non governmental organizations. That means people where they are, they're not being paid, they're doing it, they're giving their time. Giving their time for works of justice, peace, and a sa sane environment uh, in ways that are, demonstrate such ingenuity and faithfulness. There's never been a his moment in history like this. It's the strongest, largest social movement in human history. And I call it the great turning. <laughs> I think that's what the future wants, a few generations, maybe even a couple of generations into the future, will look back at us living now and say, oh, those ancestors, they didn't even know whether they could make it or not. And yet they were trying without any assurance that it would work. And they, uh, they were part of the great turning. And that great turning is uh, a revolution. It's the turning from a uh, industrial growth society to a life-sustaining one. It's turning from a view of the earth, using the earth like some a stockpile of resources from which you can extract what you want and treating it like a sewer in which you can dump your wastes. It's obscene. It's at least sickening to the soul. And more and more people are enlisting and turning from that. There are new ways of holding the earth. There are new technologies for generating energy. There are new ways of measuring prosperity. There are new forms of teaching. There are new ways of distributing food. There's so many, like sprouts, green sprouts through the rubble of a dysfunctional civilization. So uh, the treasure vases are part of that. It has many, many streams. It's a great privilege to be part of that. And part of being that uh, belonging to it is that it asks us to live in uncertainty. Because at the same time, there's the great unraveling going on of the destruction of living systems. And so we don't know which will be 
win out in the end? Is it the great turning to sustainability or the final unraveling of organic, biological, ecological systems? It's underway. And that's part of the beauty of this time, I think, to um, accept the uncertainty, say, sure, every adventure. <laughs> there wouldn't be an adventure if you knew the outcome. That's the definition of an adventure is you don't know the outcome. You don't need to know the outcome because you just do it and not knowing the outcome means that you are asked to bring forth yet greater courage and yet greater creativity. I think you could say that this is the great promise that if we say no to it, we do it at a great risk of never really discovering our beauty and our power. The great promise that we can wake up to taking a hand with the future ones. They're particularly important to me because they are going to be inheriting the poison fire. I want very much for us to leave ways of telling them what it is, helping them to know how to protect themselves from it, to be faithful, to continue in the guardianship, guardianship of the poison fire, the guardianship of the waters now, guardianship of the soil, guardianship of seeds, unaltered seeds, guardianship of human ovum, guardianship of life. That will bring forth great beauty and power from us. You know, when I look at the map of our globe and see places where people are creating new communities or where treasure vases are buried, where people are serving earth in so many uncountable value ways. Uh, I see them like stars in the sky, or it, it, it reminds me of that wonderful Buddhist uh, vision of reality, which is so appropriate for this time. It's called the jeweled net of Indra. And it's a vision of our universe uh, and the way reality is structured that in which everything is related is in a vast net. And at the node, every node of that web, there's a jewel. And each jewel is multifaceted, like the finest cut diamond, sparkling. And then it catches the reflections of all the other jewels. And then it's reflected back. And so in this holographic image, we can see Hey, that's how we're related. That's how I'm related in my world. And in the Buddhist teachings, that's what the bodhisattva, you know, the hero, heroine of the, who gets it, who really understands the teachings of our interdependence. And that bodhisattva then is of a, also a boundless heart. And you look into one and you can see all the others. So in doing, putting the prayers in your vase and burying it, or going to a 
hearing for funding for your public school so the children get some books, whatever it is. Starting your compost, whatever. You're linked. It's like you can look at that one action and see countless actions as if that's a fractal of a vast enterprise, a vast miracle, and it's not coordinated by anybody at the top. There's no ideology and no big boss. It's arising from the sacred living body of Earth itself, from life on Earth's Earth. We're alive. We're alive now. My prayer is that life go on. I want life to go on, this many splendor thing. I do not want it to end now because of our stupidity and our arrogance. I want it to be there. I want clean air and I want clean soil and I want waters, unpolluted waters for the future ones. I don't want it to be wrecked on our watch. I'd give anything. So I pray that the earth be healed through our actions that we wake up. Mm -hmm.